Well, with me now in the studio is the former Prime Minister, Paul Keating. Thanks for being here, Mr Keating. Good evening. Glad to be here. What were your thoughts on hearing this news this morning? Um, well, I had hoped he'd make the ton, you know. I thought he'd make the hundred because he was... He had a tremendous constitution. He was as strong as an ox. Um, and I, I, so, you know, one, one, one hopes, but of course, when you start, you know, when you remember, he was born during the First World War. Um, you know, we're obviously on the long stretch at 98. But what? there's a, but a, but a point of sadness, there's a, obvious, there's a change occurs, you know. Someone who's been central and important in your life goes. It's the ultimate wrench. They're not there anymore. You don't see them anymore. Do you consider that he has been important in your life? Oh, he, he, front, run, he front run the system. I mean, you know, I had a couple, a couple of people in my political life I was interested in. Lang, Lang was one, uh, Whitlam was another. I mean, Australia was a, a post-imperial outpost, effect, effectively, in the post-war years, in the, the years of the Menzies torpor. It was like sort of wading in molasses, you know, uh, and and to shock the system and change it, to change Australia's idea of itself, uh, is what Whitlam did. And the Labor Party used to trot along in the in the bilateralism of Australian public life. Um, it was not never quite sure what it ought to be doing, and all of a sudden, he used all the power of the Commonwealth to actually shift things. Um, so. Um, the, the, that, uh, and when he changed the country's idea of itself, he changed its destiny. He changed the direction. We heard Philip Ruddock say in that story that if he had just ha had uh, a little bit longer or, or taken it a little bit more slowly with the changes he wanted to introduce, that things yeah. might have ended differently. What do you think? Well, they, they may have, but he was also very unlucky. I mean, the post-war... The years of post-war growth, you know, in the economic textbooks now is sort of, you know, 1947 to 1974, you know. Um, and from 74 to 83, there was a very low period of growth, including, that's in the Whitlam and Fraser years. So he was decidedly unlucky about the nature of growth just turning up. It stopped turning up. And he, and frankly, he and most everyone else didn't know what to do about that. Nonetheless, there is a skill involved in knowing how to manage those yeah. situations, which he perhaps did not do very well. <laughs> he was a grenade thrower. I used to often say, well, I'm, I'm the grenade throwing business. Occasionally I drop one beside my foot, but I get many direct hits. He was in the direct hit business. He wanted to make Australia fairer, more decent, more open, more confident, more exciting, you know. And, uh, and he did, you know. Um, uh, you know, the re reorient the country in foreign policy terms. He wanted to make Australia, take Australia from an outpost to a bridge. We were a post-imperial outpost um, with still all of the, with all the glue of the Anglosphere hanging on us, you know. We missed the sort of, by getting out of white Australia, we missed the marginalisation that South Africa had. We missed it by seconds in time. Um, and th that change in orientation uh, and, and the, shift in, the shift in policies and domestically uh, in the big social programs like Medicare, you know, the health of any one of us is important to all of us. Um, the right to get yourself a, a secondary education and a tertiary one and, and, and further and technical and further education, these, these things. Uh, but the but whole range, like, you know, fault free divorce, um, you know, rights for women. Uh, uh, now, it was all compressed into two years and nine months. <laughs> did That's it, tough. Did it leave an economic mess, frankly, for the Fraser government and then for the Hawke Keating well, government to it, inherit? It, basically, wages blew out and inflation blew out. Inflation went to, I think, 14, 11, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think 13 or 14 per cent by uh, 1974 because wages had been exploding, there was no wages policy, we had central wage, wage fixing, the unions were strong, he didn't know what to do about any of that. Uh, he had no real help from the treasuries, uh, treasurers until, until Bill Hayden arrived. Uh, I mean, he, if he'd have had another term, you would have seen a different government. There was some order returning to that cabinet process. 
Did, yeah. When Labor returned to power in 1983, had the Whitlam government given you and Bob Hawke an idea of what you had to do, but more importantly, what not to do? It gave us, in terms, I mean, you, you, I don't think you can compare the way the Cabinet operated in the Whitlam years with the Hawke years, or my years. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the Cabinet craft, the, the specialisation, the common ownership by each Cabinet Minister in the whole program, or, or of each day's Cabinet discussion, or of each issue, was profoundly different in my experience between the two. You know? But partly, this is not a, simply attributable to Whitlam, to Gough Whitlam himself, but the fact that the Labor Party was out of office from 1949 to 1972, and you had a whole lot of inexperienced but, but ambitious people wanting to change things. So they'd forgotten how to do it? They'd, they'd forgotten how to do it, yes, they had forgotten how to do it. and uh, and uh, And they had the bureaucracy broadly offside. Um, uh, there wasn't the collegiate quality. And of course, when the wealth stopped being produced naturally in, in, the, in the world downturn, uh, it was, uh, the, the government was sort of floundering trying to work out how to restart the motor. It's impossible not to look at the Whitlam government through the prism of how it ended the dismissal. Does that event still have implications today, do you think, beyond just being a historical fascination? Oh, it definitely soured the system, and that remains true today. Uh, I mean, I, when I, I went to the House of Representatives when Gough nearly won in 1969, that was his great big election victory, really. He didn't quite get a majority, but that's it. And you still had the, you know, the opening of Parliament ball, and we'd all turn up... <laughs> There'd be goings on at the Currajong Hotel and the Canberra uh, Hotel Canberra, and we'd all roll over. And there was a so certain goodwill about it. All the goodwill disappeared after 1975. You know, because you've got to remember that not only did Malcolm Fraser's opposition try and uh, bring the government down in 75, Bill Snedden' opposition had tried to do it in 74. So after 23 years in office, the coalition didn't have the presence of mind to give the Labor government two years, you know. And of course, that that drains the goodwill from the system, and, and, so it's, and, it, and it's been drained. And it's been the same ever since. So even 40 years on, that the, the uh, current political uh, environment, you think that the bitterness and the rancour is due back to 1975? Oh yeah, yeah I mean the, the, the schism, the, the split. Is 1975, what and, is and the thing is, you see, this is why the Senate still has the power, to, technically has the power to refuse budgetary bills, and the coalition have never given that power up. There's been no. This is not like the House of Lords and the House of Commons in 1913. Um, this is uh, an unrepentant coalition view about the right to use the Senate to obstruct the money bills of the House of Representatives. What is your lasting memory, not of Gough Whitlam, the Prime Minister, but of Gough Whitlam, the man? Um, he, um, uh, there's always a sort of uh, a disassembling kindliness about Gough. Um, and thoughtful, he would look at current events and provide commentary to you. It was always a wide view, um, often self-deprecatory. Uh, um, he, he was he was sort of softer in private than you would see him in public, um, but the, the key thing is he made a difference. He was around, and we all know that he's been around. Paul Keating, thank you very much. Thank you.